agenda. <clears throat> okay. Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I uh, want to welcome everyone here in the uh, boardroom and also those who are watching us on the live stream. It is Thursday, July 30th, 5.30 p.m., and we are having our board meeting in the boardroom at the Professional Development and Technology Building on, the, on our legacy campus. We'll go ahead and begin with roll call. Larry Jepson, board member. Randall Bagley, board member. Steve Norton, superintendent. Roger Pulse for board member. Kathy Christiansen, board member. Chris Corcoran, board member. Jeff Nielsen, board member. Terry Rhodes, board member. Tim Smith, chief academic officer. Okay, and Jeff will now lead us in the pledge and give us our mission statement. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And our mission is to educate students for success in a changing world. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to flip-flop the agenda just a little bit. And we are going to begin with um, the request. Is that right? Or I need to start with public input. No, we're going to start with, with a, to give a presentation. Okay, all right. Um, with a presentation on the 2021 school uh, approval of the uh, Cache County School District School Reopening Plan, and Tim will do that for us. And then we will have public input and questions after. Okay, everyone hear me? Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> last week, we presented to you our school reopening plan and uh, took quite a bit of time on that, answered any questions, and had some public input. Um, I sent an email out to parents today. We received quite a bit of public input since that time, which we really appreciated the opportunity to hear from, from parents and teachers. I'm not gonna um, spend a lot of time going back over the plan tonight since we did that last week and you have all read that. I will just start by highlighting a couple of just tweaks I made to the plan that you'll notice in the guiding principles I tweaked um, those just a little bit, the six that are up front in the plan and then um, it used to have three options for parents. Uh, they were uh, in-person instruction, remote learning, and online uh, schooling. And that was causing quite a bit of confusion. So I combined the in-person instruction and the um, remote instruction. Because the intent is, um, if we have conditions where students are asked or staff are asked to quarantine or isolate at home that that's why we're adding the 45 minutes into the school day to allow teachers to have some time to work with those kids that are home and um, and so those two kind of go together the in-person instruction supported by remote learning and then the online school is um, up, is different and it is serving those students who don't want to return to, or don't choose to return to school at this time and, and, and remain in that environment. So today I just wanted to take a few minutes. Some of the concerns that have come in from um, parents or teachers have been just uh, surrounding, is it safe to restart um, our schools? If some of you watched the governor's um, presentation today and the epidemiologist Angela Dunn 
the governor's goal was to try to hit um, a rolling average of five by the 1st of August, which I think they announced 5.08, if I got that number right. Is that correct, Gary? Yeah, 5.08. .08. So we're pretty close to that, to, to the governor's goal, and hopefully we'll be uh, below that when we hit August 20th, when we intend to start school. But I wanted to review um, for everyone just some of the measures that are kind of behind the scenes uh, that we've been working on as a school district to ensure that we can reopen safely. As I, as I mentioned last week, um, there's one thing we've learned from this situation, it's that things are changing rapidly. And uh, I think we've made a year's worth of decisions in the last four months. And if you watch the governor's uh, press conference today, you may have noticed that they came out with a new 104 page manual on school reopening um, a day before our school reopening plans were due. So we need to go through this document and make sure all of our protocols and all of the things that we put in our plan are aligned with this 104 page document that we were unaware of before today. So that's something we'll do. We've already started our way through it. And um, for the most part, things are aligned quite well, but there, should, there might be some things that aren't. All right. So if you remember, um, what we talked about last week is our first goal on this left-hand side is um, safe and healthy schools. We want to open in a safe way. And then at the same time, we want to be able to continue to provide teaching, learning, and engagement for students. Um, and we've had a lot of feedback on that over the last um, couple of weeks since our last board meeting regarding parents um, wanting their kids back in school for a myriad of reasons, which includes their, their social and emotional health and um, to help improve the learning. So let me just start with the safe and healthy schools piece. We talked a little bit about um, prevention from a hygiene standpoint last week, and I wanted to let you know some things that we've done at the district level. Um, as easy as this sounds, I think I mentioned this also last week, hand hygiene continues to be one of the things we can do to um, combat the transmission and spread of the virus. Um, on the right hand side is a note, uh, kind of a sign we're gonna have throughout the schools. But we're gonna continue to promote that and teach it, especially in the elementary schools. Uh, the hand sanitizer we have as a district ordered um, over 5,000 bottles of hand sanitizer and that's just to get us started with um, that includes the bottles that will go into classrooms or in the common areas for student use. That includes a refill bottle to get us out of the gate with regards to hand sanitizer. Um, that's something that's in the requirements of the state. Um, probably the biggest issue is the respiratory hygiene issue with regards to, to face coverings. That seems to be turning a corner. Uh, many of you may have saw the Logan mandate. Um, today that was approved by the governor for the city of Logan to mandate mask wearing. Um, if you're like me, as I've moved around the community, you notice a lot more mask wearing in the community, which I think is a positive thing because it gets people used to that before we return to a school environment. And I would dare say mask wearing is probably gonna be our biggest tool to help mitigate some of the risk with regards to um, to returning to school, and that's why we need to get this one right. But the district has purchased over 44,000 masks. That's not disposable masks, that's cloth masks um, for students and staff. Each student will be provided with two cloth face masks. This is the 44,000 that we've ordered for students. In addition, we've ordered about 50,000 disposable masks just to get us started as well for students or staff who forget their their face covering or for visitors. Each employee will be provided with uh, one cloth face mask and a face shield if they have contact with students. This would be not only our teaching staff, but um, any of the instructional staff or other staff that have uh, interactions with students. And those will be available to our staff as well. And I probably should say, um, 
one of the things we've been working hard on, and we actually met on this week, is we really want to make sure we're also accommodating students with special needs with regards to masks and having a workable alternative where we're not putting folks at risk. And so um, we've been working on those protocols as well. So talk about those if you have any questions. All right. Um, Last week, we talked about some principles-based issues regarding how the virus spreads. And we know that the, that's why the respiratory hygiene is so important, is because most of the transmission spread is due to, to respiratory droplets. But there is um, a likelihood that, small likelihood that it's through touch surfaces and then touching your eyes and mouth and that type of thing. So we are um, spending quite a bit of time um, working on that. We have ordered cleaning supplies for all of our schools so that our custodians can work on um, high touch surfaces and make sure we're cleaning those. We have classroom cleaning materials as well that'll be provided. Um, I don't know if you're, you may have heard of a, a technology called foggers. It's really electrostatic devices that allow our custodians to disinfect large areas. Um, at a time and we did order early on in the summer. Um, part of the issue with all of these materials is ordering them and getting them in the supply chain and in the, in the, uh, in the mail before every school in the nation orders them. But we did order 25 of these and have them in our schools. Um, one of the things that uh, Gary and I did this summer was go out and visit our preschools and life skills rooms as they opened back up uh, this summer and ran some programs. And one of the things we found is those are very high touch environments uh, in the life skills areas. Um, we visited with pediatricians um, regarding school reopening and one of the uh, student groups that they are the most worried about, they're not really worried about um, children, but those life skills students that are adults, or they, they they're, to use the right language, they act like more like adults with with uh, underlying medical conditions with regards to that. And they said that's the population that they would be most careful with if um, if they focused on any population in the school with those life skills kids. So we've ordered those um, devices for those 38 classrooms, are working on that. So. Um, illness monitoring, just to let you know some, some things that we've done there. That's going to be an important aspect. Our hope is that our parents will do a good job monitoring illnesses and, not, and our staff will do the same and not come to school when they're ill. But we have provided protective equipment and supplies in our front office uh, for our front office staff so that if they have to deal with students or staff who exhibit symptoms, um, they have the equipment necessary. Uh, from a personal protective standpoint and to check for symptoms to take care of that and get hold of parents and have them come come pick up the children. One of the other things that we um, did was we uh, increased our hours for our health aides. We did put health aides into the schools for the first time last year, which in the elementary schools um, we've increased their hours in the elementary schools, so they're there for a significant part of the day to help those school secretaries to deal with the illness protocols that we have so that they have some help. And we also approved hiring additional health aides for all of our eight secondary schools so that they can uh, be there to, again to help with the front office staff to mitigate any illness protocols that we have there. All right, one of our uh, most significant concerns is our staff. And um, this is not an exhaustive list. We're still working on this. But one of the issues we're talking about is how do we protect high-risk staff that choose to come back into the schools and continue to teach. And um, so we've, we're going to mandate masks in certain classrooms with high-risk staff. So that those, those class, or we take care of some issues with regards, if we do have kids with accommodations there, to make sure that everyone's safe, to, to make sure we can maintain a six foot teaching distance between staff and students. 
Um, we are going to provide N95 masks for any staff um, that identify as high risk. And we are going to um, provide face shields as well, which we already talked about. Other measures um, that are available to staff that are high risk is to work through our HR department. And we're going to train the principals on that process on Monday on how individuals um, identify as high risk and then how they can get an alternative assignment if that's something we can accommodate. All right. Um, we face a challenge each year starting in August, and that is August is always a difficult month with regards to heat in buildings. Not all of our classrooms are air conditioned. Ten of our schools that are most recent schools were built with air conditioning. That means 15 out of our 25 schools have some air conditioning, but not throughout all of our classrooms. And that's difficult in a normal year. And you can imagine when we have a bunch of bodies in that classroom with um, masks on. So we have ordered, um, as a district, 500 units. Um, you may have noticed one out in the hall. We brought one down here today. They're a really good unit by Honeywell to um, try to take the edge off those classrooms. Uh, we've had a school that's actually been using them for uh, about a year and have had really good success for them. So we're gonna, they're air coolers. We're gonna try those in the classrooms to see if we can mitigate that problem. Um, one of the things that we think is very important is that we have consistency across our 25 schools with regards to what we're communicating. So all of our training will be done um, the same across those schools. In addition, we've standardized all of the signage across the schools. We just ordered, placed that order today for all of the signage that we have across our schools. This is just a sample of uh, four of the signs that we have that will be going in our classrooms and in our common areas. As far as training goes, um, last week when we presented the plan, we tried to talk uh, through some of the principle-based um, applications that were taught to us by the Levitt Group, who we've met with and the state has contracted with on some scientific pieces about how the, how the virus is transmitted and spread and uh, some of the things that we can do to mitigate the spread of the virus. And so we will do our first training on that with administrators on August 3rd. They have had in their hands materials before that time, but we're gonna go through in detail um, each of the scenarios in the school and help them kind of see how that they can work in their own schools with their own staff. It is principle-based, which is actually good because not every classroom in our district looks the same, not every lunchroom looks the same, uh, and not every event that takes place looks the same. So if we apply the principles, um, we think that's a better mode than trying to, trying to dictate that from a district standpoint. Uh, we will be using these tools to support remote learning with our students that are home for short periods of time and we'll continue to train our staff both in person and um, on our online training program platform in Google Meet, which is a video conferencing tool that we're using, Canvas and, and Google Classroom. And those will be important tools uh, in our online school as well or if we have to return to an online teaching experience. Um, one of the things that we realized early on is we may be in a situation where, well we know we'll be in a situation where we're going to have students or staff that need to be home. Um, one of the changes is that you'll see in the plan is not everyone, not health department's not going to, not in our plan, but in the health department 104 page document. They're not going to recommend that every student um, who has had a positive case, uh, positive case in their class be quarantined and kept from school. They're gonna wait to see if, if some of those kids are symptomatic. So um, anyway, these kits are designed to help us with remote learning and each elementary school will get 10 of those and each secondary school will receive 20 of those kits. They're basically two different types. They're an at-home kit and a classroom kit the at-home kit will allow a teacher to broadcast back into their classroom from a distance if they're out for a short period of time. 
and the classroom kits will allow the teacher to broadcast back out to students who are out at home and um, need some interaction with, with, the, uh, with the class instruction as it's going on. In addition, thanks to the um, Cash Education Foundation, which um, really helps us on a yearly basis with Tools for Schools, we've secured funding to make sure that every one of our classroom teachers have access to a microphone or camera to support um, online or remote learning. So that when they're doing office hours for those kiddos that may be at home, they have a way to, to um, speak to and be seen by those students and vice versa. Students will be given um, Chromebooks much like we did in the spring. We deployed about 5,000 Chromebooks to students and we'll follow that same pattern for anyone that is at home during this um, time. Another aspect that um, we struggled with in the spring, it was really hard to tell how widespread of an issue we had because when you send out surveys to parents asking them if they have internet access, um, you usually get all the parents who have internet access responding to those surveys and not the parents who don't have internet access. So um, we are putting, um, we're taking 10 school buses through a state grant for a quarter of a million dollars and putting um, mobile Wi-Fi on those buses. Those are our activity buses. If we get in a situation where we close again for a school dismissal, we'll, we can park some of those school buses in those locations where we don't have um, necessarily Wi-Fi access for those homes. The other thing we're doing is purchasing some mobile hotspots that will allow us to send those home with students who may not have um, internet access. And we'll scale that up as, as needed. Um, we had this in the works before this year, but this will actually be helpful. We are implementing a new Power Teacher Pro upgrade to our grading program um, that will work better with our online programs and that will uh, allow teachers to use any device to do their grading uh, where they've had to um, uh, be limited to a certain device in the past. So that'll be very helpful. Uh, we may be giving our parents a little whiplash on this one. We've been playing around with online programs and I think we've arrived this year at one that is very workable with our systems. We are implementing a new financial program for online payments. Um, this one is robust enough and works with our PowerSchool instance that we hope that, uh, and then we've removed all the uh, fees to parents, the extra convenience fees. And what we hope to accomplish here is to reduce the need for parents to come in and to handle, have our staff at school handle cash or cards. They can do all of those payments online. All right, this one, um, our online school has been a monumental effort um, by Kurt Jenkins to get this up and running as a viable alternative for those students who choose not to return to us in the fall. If you remember from the last time we met, I reported that in our initial survey to parents three weeks or so ago, we asked how many parents, given the option of in-person instruction or online instruction, would choose online instruction. We had about 8% um, choose online instruction or at least express um, a desire for that. We did open pre-registration for that a couple of, about a week ago. And we have, uh, we're about 3% of our population so far choosing that. Just to give you an idea, there's 350 students in the, um, in the elementary side of this, the cash students connect. That represents one of our small elementary schools. So um, we feel good that we can offer that alternative for parents. And we're trying to be as flexible as possible if they choose to go from school back to the online environment or from the online environment back to school. Um, we're trying to be as flexible as we can with that. Kurt, anything else you wanna report on that? Okay. Hey Tim, can I interrupt you for just one second? Sure. A couple of people have texted me to say that the live stream isn't working. Oh, okay. This is, this is our first night running the live stream. 
and it was working when we started the meeting, so All right. I'm and sure I have a couple picture. technicians working in the background, so you're on it? Okay, thank you. As far as um, mental so and social and emotional health of our students, that's been something a lot of our parents have mentioned and appreciate the opportunity to return to in-person instruction. But we, our Project AWARE, which um, works on these issues, we're not limiting that to students who return to in-person instruction, but hope to provide those services across any of the learning environments that we work in. We have an excellent staff in that area, and that's something that we have really worked hard the last couple of years to, to scale up. And Kurt's in charge of that, too, and has done a great job with that. We, are, um, we have operated in our elementary schools um, well, we operated it for many years without counselors. We started adding back in counselors um, just several years ago, a few years ago. And we hope to be able to, we've got a state grant to be able to have a counselor per every elementary school. That has been a, a great thing um, even before we hit this crisis. And we think that'll be a positive uh, thing for our elementary schools as we move forward. We're putting the, the finishing touches on that. And that's kind of what we've done, behind, some of the things we've done behind the scenes, probably not all. I mentioned to you that we are in the process of developing all the protocols um, that we have for illness and hygiene and cleaning protocols. Those are all done. We just uh, finished up with the health department last week on finishing our case investigation and contact tracing protocols and how those will be handled. Um, the governor went over some of those specifics today in his press conference um, regarding that. We did have an instance today where we had some misinformation coming out of our, our local health department that did not jive with what the governor announced. So we've tried to fix that issue um, today. So hopefully we got that resolved. What other questions does the board have regarding either the plan itself or anything we've covered tonight? Um, in, uh, on the, the assurances document that we have to submit to the state school board, yep. um, it suggests that every school will have a point of contact available for questions and concerns. Is Correct. that the principal in each school? Yes. In our district? Yes. And okay. I've already sent that to the health department, well, all of the principal's school phone numbers and cell phone numbers. Okay. Thank so. you. Thanks for all your work on this, Tim. Oh, no problem. It's been a big project. Um, I had <clears throat> one parent ask, is it going to be possible for their student to have a hybrid of online and in person? Yeah, and we, we have been trying to accommodate that. Some parents feel comfortable sending their students for part of the school day for some activities and not for others. And I've had several of those as well. And we've, we've tried to accommodate those situations. Had a father call me um, a couple of days ago worried about their student who didn't have access to maybe some of our AP programs but wanted to choose the online option. And I worked with Kurt on that. We, we can reach out to other programs and make sure that student has access to the AP programs um, that they're looking for. So who we're trying call? to resolve issues we can on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, who do they call if they're interested in that? Um, they can call Kurt and he okay. will, if they're in the online school and they need access to some courses that aren't there, okay. we can work with them on that. So Tim, on the, the governor did mention what would happen if we had positive cases. Just go over what we're going to do there if we have positive in the classroom or a school. Okay. And I don't have those protocols pulled up, but I'll do my best to speak to them. Um, that's what that... 104 page manual they released today and I haven't had a chance to go through and see if that jives with what the local health department covered. But basically if there is a positive case, um, the health department will be notified by our local health providers. They will take the responsibility of working with the families that um, are involved in a positive case, both isolating the person that has a positive COVID case and uh, deciding who um, is quarantined. 
and who they suggest is quarantined. That's probably the issue that um, has the most questions right now is how that quarantining is going to work exactly. However, they will, once they've done their case investigation, they will contact the school. That's why um, one of the things we're asking the teachers to do is to assign seats and for us to keep track of students and where they are to the best of our ability. And exposure, just um, for your information, and I went through this personally when I came down with COVID in June, is um, any, anybody you've been in contact with who has the virus and have been face-to-face uh, -face with them for longer than 15 minutes in a space under six feet. But the health department um, pointed out that that's one of the important aspects of a face mask is they don't consider it an exposure if you've passed that limit and, you, and both parties are face masked. So that's where we'll have to work with them on that. The other aspect that they really wanna be aware of is anyone in that school that is considered high risk if they have a positive case, they want to make sure that they contact those individuals and give them some options with regards to quarantining. But you may have heard the governor um, talk today about the three cases and how three cases will constitute an outbreak in a, in a classroom, something like 15 cases in a school. And then we'll work with our local health department to make decisions on sending entire classrooms home or um, schools so that's one of the things we'll work through with the health department that's basically in a nutshell how that whole aspect of that works tim also there's been some concern about special needs students could you just address that topic a little bit uh -huh, absolutely so jenny bust our uh, uh, special education director has been working hard on that with her staff, we have, uh, in addition to the other protocols I talked about, we have a whole list of protocols for our special ed department, whether staff are working in a close one-on-one -on -one environment with special needs kids, or they're doing testing through the school psychologists, or some of those aspects, there are protocols for each of those instances in working with those special needs students um, that are a little bit different than, than our normal school population. And she's here today if you have any questions about that. And anything? She's right over here. Oh, anything I missed, Jenny? Um, I can play Donahue. The one thing that I did want to bring up is, um, the one thing that I, the most questions that I've been having about this is for students who have chosen the online option, whether or not their IEP services will be provided. Yes, they will. Um, and that is, I mean, obviously federally mandated. They, the service pattern and service minutes will probably look different than it would in person. But yes, those accommodations, modifications, and instruction will be given. As of right now, we don't know. I think elementary, I have around 40 kids in the district that have signed up through various schools. And then, and then in the secondary, I think I have around 20. Um, and so we're still making a decision on whether or not, how we're going to approach that, whether we're going to pay the special education teachers that hold their file or teach them um, extra and how that would look, we're still trying to figure out, or if we would hire an online special education teacher to address those goals. So we're still in the works with that, just kind of waiting to see, get some more concrete numbers with the special education. So, yep, we're working on all that, thanks. Do we have any protocols in place for uh, recess, lunch hours, transportation? I've had that question asked. Yeah, so that times. mitigating strategies document that I gave you that accompanies the plan, it has all of those um, at least general strategies for working in those settings. Those are going to have to be worked out at the school level for specific instances where a school may be unique but you have in that document all the general aspects of mm -hmm. transitions, busing, um, classrooms, uh, large, large group assemblies or that type of thing. So, and we'll, we can add to that mitigating strategies as we need to and I think that's in large part what some of this 104 page document from the governor goes into. And that'll be helpful for us. Are there any other questions from the board? Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, Tim, tell me since the plan, the first draft came out last week, 
Monday evening a week ago, this past Monday. How have you, um, how have you gauged teacher and other staff support for this plan? And, and, and have you done that in a structured way? Um, and, you know, in terms of the decisions that are being made about, you know, a lot of the, the tools that you're, that you're adding to the, the arsenal, so to speak, um, how, how are those teachers being included in, in decisions about that process and how are they being informed about these yeah. additions and changes? Good, good question. Um, one of the difficulties in this whole thing is the speed at which we're having to develop these plans with new protocols coming out underneath as we're trying to drive, fly the airplane. We're getting additional information from air traffic control on how we handle that. Um, we, we haven't done it, well, we have done a structured um, feedback. We have all of the feedback that we've received um, from st staff and parents in the surveys that we have. We've gone through that. Some of that is quantitative in nature and some of that is qualitative in nature. The information that I presented you last week um, on the qualitative pieces were the aspects of teacher and parent concerns that riz, rose to the top on their concerns, and we've tried to address all of those in the plans and in the protocol. Since, to answer your question specifically, since that came out, um, we've been so busy looking at alternatives and other th aspects of what we could do that I have not sat down and actually hand counted positives and pros for all of the emails that I received. So I can only tell you anecdotally. We have not received a lot of feedback from teachers since what you received in the board meeting a couple of weeks ago from the teachers who came and spoke in board meeting last week. I would say that's been minimal over the last two weeks. Um, we have received um, not a significant amount, but uh, some concerns about our plan and opening on August 20th from parents, but it's probably been at a one to 10 ratio for, or maybe even a little higher for those parents who are expressing the desire to want to start school on August 20th with a Monday through Friday schedule. I think I had about 60 emails from parents yesterday uh, on that issue wanting us to, to follow the plan as we developed it. This morning I had about 160 emails in my inbox on that same topic and um, we went through and responded to each one of those um, parent emails with mostly with just a thank you for the feedback but if there was some question in there we tried to address a question on both types of emails so whether they were had concerns or whether they were expressing their support for the plan but I, I couldn't give you a percentage of uh, without doing it anecdotally on that does that answer your question well sort of I'm asking more specifically about teachers and staff not about parents and so I'm asking do you have do you know you do you have any feel for what kind of support you have among teachers and staff for the no i did and, and the, our ceaea president i we have been in contact with her i asked her that question she's here tonight about um whether or not we had if she had any idea of what her numbers look like with teacher concerns and so and happy to would you like to yeah happy to have her comment on that Hi everybody. Um, I think the teachers do have some concerns. We definitely want to open. Some of us would like to open right on time. Some of us would like to open in a few days, like the following week, give us a couple days to get things planned and figured out. A lot of us are really concerned about how it's going to actually look in person. I've been watching um, all of the people in this room and I've been watching um, your mask hygiene because we know how important that is. And we know it says, Cover your mouth, cover your nose, and then don't touch it. And then stay six feet away if you can't do that. And most of us are doing a really good job. There's a couple people that are kind of struggling, and we're adults, and we know how important it is, and we're the kind of nerds who come to school board meetings. So I'm wondering how that's gonna work in, in real life with children. And I know that's a concern a lot of teachers have. I think that we've gotta get something into the state. We know that, so we have to do something quick so we can get it in so it's still valid. I think we better be ready to pivot once we see new information come out. 
And I think the teachers will be ready to pivot. We just want to be safe and we want to be with our kids so we can teach them. Thank you. Watching you see if you hand sanitize after touching my mic. Oh, you got it back there. You are good. Tim, will you uh, review for us what the what the survey results were of the teachers that you shared with us last week? Sure. Yeah, I can go back through those. Absolutely. Uh, and this is not specifically teachers, this is all employees, because we did survey all employees. This is the, um, this is the one where we asked um, whether our staff considered themselves high, high risk or someone in their family at high risk. That was 30%. We're, one of the difficulties is we're, um, we're, our administrators have been working hard to figure out who those individuals are in their schools. We don't have a firm number on that or who's going to ask for accommodations. I've talked to several staff who filled this out and said, well, yeah, I marked high risk because that's what you asked, but I'm not gonna ask for an accommodation with regards to that. I'm just, I'm gonna come and teach and just take care of myself. Um, and others obviously have um, expressed some concern. We're going to train our administrators on Monday on the protocols for how um, staff work with our HR department to identify as high risk and what kind of strategies we can help with there. Um, we ask our staff about face coverings. And again, this is a changing issue about how many um, didn't have any limitations or restrictions with regards to wearing a face covering. That was 95% felt like they could, they could comply with that as a staff, which is a very good sign. Um, this is one that I, I think I explained last week is um, I, I would like to get some more information on this one. This is whether we could stay home sick. And since we asked all employees, and we could break this down if we needed to, you know, 90, we, we talked about how teachers have been, have self-cultured themselves over the years that it's better to drag themselves to school sick instead of get a substitute. And we want to try to do everything we can to switch that culture to please stay home sick. We'll figure out your classroom. If we can't get a sub, we'll figure out a sub. Um, but I totally sympathize or empathize with their position from a teaching standpoint and being away from those students and feeling like they have important things to commu communicate to those students and finding it difficult to have a substitute in the classroom, but that's something we want to mitigate. That 7% or 6.7% that say that it would be difficult for them to stay home um, is probably our part-time staff who actually lose um, pay for that. But our Emergency Leave Act, um, that a federal act, allows any of our staff, whether they be part-time or full-time, to take advantage of the two weeks of sick leave if they have a COVID-related event in their household. And I think there's six criteria that they can qualify for that leave, and we're prepared to, to work with them for that as well. Um, so we're hoping to mitigate all of those issues as well. Um, oh, I missed a slide up. Turn around. Okay. Oh, no, I didn't take it as rude. So she said she didn't mean to use the word nerdy when she talked about the staff that are here. So she apologizes. You're not nerds. Thank you. Um, I missed this slide. This is the slide, and I'm not in presentation mode, so this is all showing here, which is fine. I won't go through them one at a time. These are um, the employee concerns that we had early on. Uh, it was about face coverings, and there's lots of issues with regards to face coverings with our employees. And those come out in the open-ended remarks all the way from, wow, do I really have to wear a face mask to, do you know how difficult it's going to be to teach in a face mask? Um, I'm having a little trouble, to be, to be honest with you, getting enough air in this thing. Um, I can tell a difference in trying to speak in a mask and versus if I were in a face shield or something like that. Um, so face, uh, face coverings also affects our staff is what do we do if we have students in our classroom who refuse to wear a mask 
and we are prepared as a district to have our administrators um, resolve those issues for our staff if they've asked politely or have some issues with some of the students in their classrooms who are not wearing masks. And then we have some accommodating um, issues with students with special needs. Um, taking time off, which we talked about uh, when ill, finding a substitute is a huge issue. We had access this week to a survey from the Canyon School District who sent it out to teachers all over the state. Um, Cash did have some teachers represented in that. We were calculating the numbers from the percentage and we probably only had four or five teachers contribute, but it does give us a snapshot of teachers across the state and what their concerns off are, and that is a big issue for teachers. The issue I covered just a few minutes ago is can I take time off when ill? What if I'm out of sick leave? And we do have solutions for all of those issues. How do I find a substitute if we can't find substitutes? And we're gonna work just as hard as we can to help um, mitigate those things. School cleaning was an issue. Who has responsibilities for school cleaning? Um, we are hoping that those adults in the school who are able can help us with that since we have a limited custodial staff that will be um, doing their vet very best in all of our schools. And our, our custodial staff are top notch as far as their dedication. They're in education for much the same reason we all are. They like kids and they wanna make a difference with kids. And I think they're gonna be as protective as they can as well. Uh, I mentioned the clear expectations across schools and classrooms came out of the survey with employees of just being as uniform as we can across our school. We've talked about that at the district level, um, about our hat policies in some of our schools. You can go into some of our schools, and I remember this as an administrator, and um, you have a hat policy, no hats, but you can walk into three or four of the classrooms in the school and the students are wearing hats because the staff member in that classroom is not enforcing the policy. And so it really creates and muddies the waters for all of the others that are trying to hold the protocol. Well. That's really a simple thing that we didn't worry about too much at that time, but it's something in the case of face masks that we gotta be a little more vigilant about and making sure that all of our staff are unified on the expectations um, across all of our schools and classrooms. And that's what we're hoping our administrators are working with our staff members on. Um, the number five was difficulty in supporting both online and in-person instruction. And that's a large concern of our teachers who know what it takes to try to teach online from their spring experience and the amount of time that that takes. And that's why we're not requiring our teachers to necessarily do a full online program. That's completely self-contained and we'll have teachers staffed in that online program to take care of the students who choose to be in online full-time. What we are asking them to do is try to help those short-term students who are out of their classroom for a number of days and um, work with those students and that's why we've shortened in our plan the, the, the class or the day by 45 minutes. Um, class sizes are an issue and this is probably a good time to bring this up. There's a little bit of confusion I think on the part of our teachers about well I can't possibly social distance at six feet in my classroom and that's absolutely true. Our classrooms are not designed to fit the number of students we have in our classes and maintain a six foot distance. And that is why the governor's mandate or directive on masks is so critical because that helps us to mitigate the inability to be six feet from each other by making sure and ensuring our kids and staff members are in masks. Um, and we'll do the very best we can with that. We are gonna have a little bit smaller classroom size just from the students who are picking online but that's not gonna be a significant uh, enough of a number to, to, to be able to space at the, at the uh, six foot level. And then this last one I talked about pretty at length last week about protecting our high risk population. And that's a concern we all have. We don't wanna open our schools and put anyone at more risk than, than need be with regards to high risk. And so we're gonna try to mitigate those factors as well. Uh, Chris, I had one more answer to your question, and it was on my brain just a few seconds ago um, with regards to how we've been working with staff. But if I think about it, I'll let you know it's, it's gone. 
Are you able to comment on um, the possibility of a late start or not? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can talk about that. We spent a considerable amount of time exploring options for um, a little bit later of a start. Um, we looked at trying to see if we could push it back to August 26 to give ourselves a little bit more time. We just hit a snag with that reg regarding the state law. We were trying to do it without pushing the calendar back uh, any further than we had to or modifying some of our vacation days. We were trying to adhere to our school calendar as much as we could. So we had a way to use some um, professional development days that the state would allow us to do, but there was a caveat in that law that um, kind of held us up in the end of having to have that out to the public 90 days um, before. So we've looked at, um, I got an email yesterday from a parent asking about AM PM schedules and I responded back to that one about how it's more difficult for us. Logan's not going to an AM PM, but they could because they have such a compact geographic area and enough buses to be able to pull that off. That's difficult for us as geographically spread as we are a school district. Um, so that was, that was one that we consider, have considered all along, but it's, it's very difficult to accomplish. We have looked at an AB schedule. Uh, Logan, there's been some confusion about that. Parents thinking Logan is going on that and staying on that. That's a short-term thing they're doing. I think their justification is to ease into the routines a little bit more, um, which is a great idea. Um, the AB schedule is hard to pull off. I think their class lengths are about 20, 23 minutes. Um, maybe it's 21 minutes um, each, each class period during those 17 days. And then that's having students there every other day. So that's hard to pull off anything meaningful about you know, pursuing the education of the kids at the same time. Um, we have talked about and we're working on and um, possibly staggering some of our secondary schools out of the gate just to allow us where they're so large to allow us to do just that, to practice some of those routines. Um, our elementary schools have expressed wanting their students all there because then they can work with that class of 30 and um, work through some of those routines over the first few days of school. We need to take a little pressure off teachers that they don't have to cover their curriculum at the same level we would do in a normal year. Our goal right now is to get kids here, get them here safely, teach them to help us in um, monitoring some of the routines and the protocols and self-monitoring themselves and being part of the solution. So we hope as we train our staff, that's a lot of what goes on in those initial days. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay, thank you. That was awesome, Tam. Okay. Um, your staff and you have done a real lot of work in putting this together and it was an arduous project to do in a short amount of time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and um, go into the public input and I just want to give you a few guidelines as we move into this. First of all, we do have a paper up here. The official paper didn't arrive so it's just the back of a, it's just a blank paper but would you please put your name on it? after you have presented um, at the microphone. And if you want further <clears throat> information from the district, you can put your phone number as well and they will get back to you. Um, let me see, what else? Uh, your comments are limited to three minutes. And are we set up to um, do that, Tim? To I'll have the. Yeah, I'll get there and take care of that. Right, oh. gonna do it. Okay. So there will be up here on the screen a countdown so you can see how fast your three minutes are going. The third thing is that um, no personnel comments are allowed. And the last um, requirement to participate in the public in input is to be respectful and let me just say to be kind. And we had wonderful presenters at our last public input Hey. who um, it was just a pleasure to listen to them because they were very respectful and kind. So we'll go ahead and start and you just need to come up to the microphone. Um, after you're done, go ahead and use the hand sanitizer <clears throat> and um, fill, fill out your name on the list. Did I forget anything? 
lights. I'll get them. <clears throat> It's Eileen again, and I wanted to thank you for taking some of those things on the hot spot and that and applying that. That made me feel much better. I want you to know that four or five years ago, I went out and purchased one of those wonderful Honeywell um, air conditioners. Warning, it needs to be vented outside. So if you use it, you're going to have to have a classroom with windows because if you don't, you're going to have all that extra hot air blow right back into your classroom. Second warning, the sound that it emits and the white noise it creates for kids who are hearing impaired is a problem. So I appreciate the fact that you went through and did that, but that's just the voice of experience there. My second item is on substitutes. If we have enough substitutes. In the past, we have, and teachers don't show up, they have accidents, they get sick, they leave. I have been asked to give up my preparation hour many times to cover classes. Is that how we're going to do it? That's my first question. The second way that they have asked me to do it is they give me and my neighbor's classroom two classes at the same time and I miraculously go between two rooms and cover two classes. I hope that is not part of the solution there. The third thing is, I don't understand the 90-day law because Jordan School District uh, yesterday changed their uh, start time to two weeks later on that. So I, I'm questioning that. If Jordan District could do it yesterday, why can't we? Um, and then the third thing, am I on three or four? I lost track. Anyway, it was time. We are to take a plan that the teachers have not had very much input, very little, and we are supposed to take all of that and we are the ones who are going to be implementing it. We are going to be given kits, 20 kits in a class, in a school of my size that has over 50 teachers. I hope we don't have to have competition for those and if so, how will that competition be worked out? When will I be trained on that? Also, um, the protocols. Um, I'm not too sure what the protocols are. I'd really like to see that hundred and some odd page that came out today because that was far different than what we had been told. And um, I think that's everything. Thanks. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Be sure to sign your name. Anyone else? Hi, Teresa Stanton. You all know me. Hello. Um, thank you for all the hard work that you've done so far. I know this is a really hard one, and there's not one good answer. Um, as you know, I sent you that big, long email of teacher concerns. Um, they don't need to all be addressed now, because I know that we have that deadline to get the initial plan into the state, but I hope that you have the time to address some or all of them before we actually start class in person. The other thing is, um, the survey that Tim referred to, that the teacher down in Canyon School District did, that's open source. Um, I'm friends with her personally. It's open source. We can give that exact same survey to our people, and we can see what our ta cash teachers and staff think. We don't even have to build it. We can just download it as a Google survey and send it out. Then we would have that information. Um, I am one of the cash teachers who took it. The whole thing took me probably five minutes. It's not a huge time investment. It's already, it, it just runs. So I would suggest that we look into that. The other thing is, I'm not that kind of teacher who's gonna say everybody's doing it, we should too. But Eileen has a really good point. Other districts have managed to change their calendars. I don't know if that's the right answer, but I think we should at least consider it. We don't have to decide to do it today, but we might need to decide to do it in a couple days. I know I said it last time, but I'm really concerned about the fair. I think we're gonna get a big group of people together I hope that they make the choice to stay masked up and still have fun. I'm pretty sure that there's a way you can wear a mask and still eat a funnel cake. But we've got to know what we're actually getting into. We've got to make sure that we can be safe once we get those kids together. Right now, we have lower numbers among children. Maybe it's because we haven't had our children together. My personal child hasn't been sick a day since March, which is weird because she was in kindergarten and she had been sick so much, just sniffles. The nose, the nose, the nose all the time. It hasn't happened. 
because she hasn't seen anyone. But she hasn't seen anyone because I'm high risk, and so I've been keeping her away from her friends because I don't want her to be the person that brings COVID home to me and her baby brother. I don't want any of the kids in my class to be the one that brings COVID home to their families or to their teacher. So I think we've just got to keep all of that in mind and be ready to be real agile and pivot real fast because I think the situation is going to change on us before we actually get our kids in their class. Thank you for your time and thank you for working so hard for us. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Teresa. I didn't want you to forget me, so I wore tie-dye again, and this time I wore my mustache mask. <laughs> um, I am a first grade teacher at Wellsville, Melissa Giddings, and just some of the things that I'm concerned about, and I know some of the other teachers are, I know that a lot of teachers didn't feel like they had too much input, which I understand that there's a lot of teachers and a lot of opinions. Um, going along with what Eileen said about having to prepare and be ready, our first meeting with my principal is August 10th, which I think is district, pretty much district wide. I worry that I have three contract days before school starts to learn what I'm supposed to do with my first graders and learn how to implement it. My concern is that I would like some time to know what my classroom is going to look like. Um, taking away those 45 minutes does not seem like a lot of time if I have sick kiddos that I have to figure out how to do the distance learning. The other thing is taking away that 45 minutes, what is the difference in my instructional minutes looking like? There was such a push last year, and I remember my team of first grade teachers, we sat for hours trying to make what the district asks of us in instructional minutes work. And now they're gonna change that, and I don't feel like we have the time to sit and figure that out starting on August 20th. I want to come back to school. I want to have my kids in my classroom. I, am, I was very excited about this year because we were able to hire one more <laughs> first grade teacher. So we go from having 28 first graders last year now to 20 and thrilled about that but I am still extremely worried about how I'm going to implement this plan that I, as a teacher, have yet to see. When you asked that question about recess and lunch, I was thinking, exactly, what is that gonna look like? I don't know what that's gonna look like for me yet. And I just don't think there's that much time um, for all of that. I worry about who's gonna clean who is in charge of cleaning? We have one custodian at our elementary school. Will instructional minutes be set so that I have time to accommodate extra hand washing for 20, 15, 20 first graders, teaching them how to clean their desks, those types of things. I feel like I need a little bit of extra time to figure that out. Again, though, I appreciate how impossible this is it's impossible for me as a teacher to think about, let alone having to come up with a plan. So thank you. Thank you. First, let me say thank you for what you do. I know this is probably not easy. Appreciate all the teachers. Um, as you all recognize, I'm the only one in the room besides the lady in the back not wearing a mask. I've traveled probably 10, 15,000 miles during this whole thing, all around the Western United States working. My kids have not worn masks. We have not been quarantined. We've, not, we've been doing common sense things. 
like our moms and dads told us all our lives, and it's working. Um, and so I just have a few questions uh, about this plan. First of all, and maybe maybe this was mentioned, but where did the where did the money come from to buy these 500 portable AC units? Because they range from 400 to about 600 bucks a piece. So that's 215 to 305 thousand dollars for 500. So where'd the money come from? That's a, that's a question for the board. Where'd the money come from? Um, what we'll do with uh, your questions is write them down. Okay. And will you put your phone number? Perfect. And then the person who is over that area, we can get the information and then get it to you. That's perfect. Okay. okay thank you. Um, question about repercussions for choosing not to wear a mask. It was mentioned that the principals or administrators would have a solution. What's that solution look like? What is that solution? Because I can tell you right now, my children will not wear a mask to school. And there's nothing in the state law that allows you, or this district, or any district, to deny access to education in person. And so my children will not wear a mask. What do you do about all the other children that won't wear a mask? I have six kids in this school district. One in high school, two in middle school, the rest in elementary. And they love their schools. They do. And they love their teachers. And they want to go back to school. But I have one who does speech therapy. Explain to me how she's supposed to do speech therapy with a mask on. I have one that has, has Asperger's syndrome and sensory issues. Explain to me how she's going to wear a mask. Explain to me how my other kids with anxiety issues or any kids with any of these symptoms are going to wear a mask. And I realize that, yes, you say you have exemptions for the IEP and the 504. Well, my kids don't have those. My kid, don't, my kid that has Asperger's does. And so my question is, and I'll be glad to write this down, but what are you going to do? You're going to march my kid to the office? You're going to march anybody else's kid to the office and say, hey, mom, dad, come get your kid because little Johnny won't wear the mask. Little Johnny, you know, and teachers, my concern, and I'm out of time, but let me express my last concern, please. My concern is teachers are going to spend more time telling little Johnny to put his mask back on right and instructing people how to, do a, how to put on a mask, how to clean, what happens if little Johnny sneezes in the math book that 20 kids are sharing? You're going to burn the, you're going to burn the book? You got a burn barrel out back? What are you, what are you going to do? Thank you. How, how do you address these issues? Thank you. Be sure and put your phone number down so we can get back with you. I will. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Hi, Kurt Benjamin. Um, Thank you for what you do. Uh, I'm a patron of the district and also represent teachers that you've heard from today. And I didn't intend on getting up here until I heard some from some of our teachers and some of the issues and questions that were asked from the board that I think I'd like to address. I think if, uh, if you were to pull teachers, I think you'd find it cuts along lines, right? I think you would find teachers that want to go back in as soon as possible at 8 o'clock on the first day of school that's scheduled on the calendar and be excited about doing that. Others would have some severe trepidation about doing that, right? I'm not sure a, a poll will tell us a whole lot more about the, the demographics of who wants to show up and, and, and who doesn't. But, you know, we, I, I agree with my president here that we could certainly send out a poll about, uh, about how people are feeling about this. I think it comes down to, you know, some principles and data, right? So what are the principles? How are we going to make people feel safe and be safe while they're teaching, right? Um, speaking from the position of the, of, of the employees in front of the kids. And then also, how are we, uh, what's the data telling us? What are the numbers doing in the county? What's the health department telling us? And I think a third part is this excellent collaboration that we've experienced uh, with the district 
um, and being able to talk about concerns. Some of you, you heard about today, uh, do we delay the start to the 26th, for example? That was one idea that's been in the room already here. Um, Ogden, Iron County, just learned, just, you know, Jordan, uh, they've, they've found a way to do that. I'm not sure what that way looks like. I've talked to some of my, my friends. Um, is that something that's still worth exploring if people are feeling hesitant about going back and giving time and space for the district and the teachers to feel comfortable coming back in? I, I think that's still worth exploring. Um, I, uh, I don't have any, as you can see uh, from from the comments already, as you've been hearing, the hundreds, of th if not thousands, of different comments that people have been disseminating to you. I can't even imagine what your reading workload looks like a little bit today after UEA's announcement. But, and that's the last thing I want to end on. You need to know that despite what UEA has talked about, right, we are happy. I think our president's happy with what's happened in terms of the dialogue, with the inclusion and in talking about it. And if we're looking at health data, and if we're listening to teachers, and we're, and we're exploring ideas together, the process has been excellent. And I think I just would put into the room, explore just a little further some options so your folks can feel pretty comfortable coming back in. Thanks. Thank you, Kirk. Good evening. Um, I just want to appreciate Mr. Booth's comments and point out we are all mostly six feet apart and don't need the mask on for, for safety reasons. I want to speak up as a parent for the silent majority of parents that, for the most part, just go along to get along. For the most part, most of us, sure, you know, we want to be safe. But fear is ruling so much of this, and the children feel it. The children need to be able to go back to school without feeling that fear. And all of the accommodations, or not accommodations, but the requirements that are being made are causing more fear than the disease itself is going to produce. Okay, the disease is a dangerous disease. It needs to be, we need to be cautious. But children <clears throat> don't spread that. The studies have shown there's not a single child that has spread this disease to an adult. Look it up. To a, to a teacher. This is worldwide, not a single case. Our children need the options of going to school without the face shields, the masks. Now, I'm one of those parents that will go along to get along. I'll wear a mask in the store because I don't want to make an argument at Walmart. Okay? But there comes a point where the kids need to see things normal. We need to start schools on time. We need to have school full time. The kids need normalcy. They need to see their teachers talking to them. I also have a student or a child that is a speech therapy student. How are they going to learn how to say the words without seeing the teacher's mouth? How are they going to learn to articulate? How is the speech teacher going to help them? when they're supposed to be talking to each other and seeing closely. And is my child going to be shamed because they don't wear a mask? Do they have to explain to everybody why they're not? That's not fair either. We need flexibility for those students who seriously cannot wear a mask. I've got friends that could not come tonight that wanted to because they've got a student, they've got a daughter that's a special, uh, needs special help. She can't wear a mask for for, uh, because of her, uh, gosh, I can't think of the word, autism reasons. She cannot wear a mask, and she needs to be in school. And they couldn't come tonight because they refused to wear a mask for good reasons. I just want to emphasize we need to spread confidence, not fear. And a lot of, a lot of what we're feeling is fear and apprehension. And I can understand the teacher's apprehension of trying to get school ready in time. That's a huge deal. I used to be a school teacher myself. It's way a lot to put on load. But let's have our teachers do what they can, do
do their best and hit the ground running and do our best come August 20th. I think that's the start date. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Be sure and sign the list. Is there anyone else who would like to comment? Thank you for your time. Um, so being a student at Green Canyon High School, I just wanted to address a few slight concerns. So when school is closed down in, uh, I think, early spring, I, haven't, I didn't really learn much. It kind of put a crutch to my learning. And I really do not, I emphasize, do not want to have that experience again. I want to be able to go back to school, have the social in interaction, and as kids, we need that social interaction that helps us learn quite a deal. It's quite important. And Zoom meetings don't really quite cut it. Um, wearing the masks, you can, it's quite hard to understand people as several of us have um, experienced. And the delay to school uh, will just make things more confusing. It'll be harder to get back on track. We need to get back on track so that way we can be able to go to school and learn. The teachers are working overtime. Um, when they went online school uh, last spring, they were barely able to get it out from the uh, two teachers I talked to, and they're really struggling. So we need to just have classes with the kids and the teachers, and we all just need to go back to normal life. We, we can't take this anymore. Enough is enough. And really, I just want to emphasize that point, and thank you for your time, and thank you. Thank you for your student viewpoint. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned at our last meeting with our public input, one of the great things about um, the people in this area is we, you are all good people and it's so easy to conduct a public input session with you because you are kind and you are respectful. And I think all of you understand that this is not an easy project to be working on and it probably isn't going to get much easier as we move along for a little while. Um, I uh, had between Oh, I'd say 150 and 250 emails today and yesterday with uh, the same uh, flavor. Very respectful, very, very kind. And um, it means a lot that um, you will come and share your comments. We're not going to make everyone happy, but we are going to try really hard once the plan um, is passed to work out any of the details that uh, we can that will make it better for everyone. So I am going to take a motion to approve the Cache County School District school reopening plan for the 2021 school year. I move that we approve the Cache County School District school reopening plan for the 2020-2021 school year. I second it. We'll go ahead and vote. Oh, sorry, any discussion or questions? You want to go ahead? No, you can go ahead. No, go ahead. <clears throat> um, I, uh, before we vote, I, I, I think that, Tim, you've done a fantastic job. Um, the whole district has put a lot of work into this, or, you know, people in the district office. And I, um, you know, I, I, just want to first of all let you know how much I appreciate the people who work for the district. I've, I've known uh, you know many of the people including Dr. Norton who worked for um, the district administration for a long time, worked on community councils, a couple of building task forces and now on the school board and you have an impossible task. You know you were given these guidelines from the state a few weeks ago and you've had to respond and there's a demand that you pass this um, before August 1st, even though, you know, new guidelines obviously just came out today from the governor's office. 
And so I, I want to just say this as respectfully as I can because I love my colleagues on the board. I love the people in the district office and I know that you guys have uh, really good intentions. But I think it's really important that I, I actually at this point um, you know, talk for just a minute about why I'm voting against this, this plan as a member of the school board. And, and I, I do this again with utmost respect for, for everybody in this district. Um, and, and one thing I've always loved about Dr. Norton is he's you know an avid reader. He's a student of history. And you know everybody knows what Normandy is. I mean that, that's of course famous. Uh, not as many people know what Dieppe is. You probably do, Dr. Norton. It was the it was the ill-fated inv invasion of continental Europe in 1942 that happened, you know, way too prematurely, and it was it was a catastrophe. And, you know, of course, Normandy we remember rightly as a huge success. And, you know, the the problem with the F that they learned from was that they just weren't ready. They weren't equipped. They didn't have the right equipment. Um, they didn't have the right strategy. And you know Normandy, as successful as it was, it's you know they started planning that you know well over a year in advance. It took a long time for them to develop the technology and the tools and so on, and the strategy. And and I I again, you know, with with all due respect to people in the district because you've you've been working under impossible circumstances, I think this plan is more Dieppe, you know, than it is Normandy. And my concern is you know, mainly with the teachers. I understand what the parents want. I've heard from a lot of parents in my precinct, and I, I know. I mean, I also have a son at Green Canyon. I so much appreciate you being here. I could not pay him enough to show up to a school board meeting to comment. And so for you to be so civic-minded is, is really admirable. Um, he's also at Green Canyon. He plays football. He starts for the varsity team. I want him desperately to have a normal year. I want that. I don't want any disruption of the football season, sports, extracurricular activities, classes, whatever. I mean, we all do. We all just want to go back to normal. Um, but, you know, as, as you pointed out as well, you know, your mother, you know, COVID is a serious problem. And, and it's not, you know, simply going you know, to disappear anytime soon. And, and we have to deal with it just like you know, people in the United States have dealt with these kinds of crises for, for centuries. And so, you know, my concern really doesn't have to do with the amount of work that the districts put into this. I, I think my concern just has to do with the soldiers in this battle that we're sending. I mean, the soldiers here are our teachers and staff. And, and it's easy for everybody as parents or, you know, patrons of the district to say, to the soldiers, go take that hill. You know, just go do it. But you know, you need the right strategy and you need, you need the right tools. You need to make sure that they're equipped to succeed. You know, in the end, to be victorious. Um, and you know, Tim, I asked you the, those questions about staff reason. Again, I'm, I, I know what you're saying. You're trying to fix the car while you're driving it. Really difficult when you know guidelines are changing from day to day. And so my concern isn't with the, the measures that you're taking to address those individual concerns because I know you're processing those and you're trying to address them. It has more to do with how the staff and faculty feel. And, and to be fair, I don't know exactly. All I know is, is what I've heard from teachers. And I just want to read you one example, which I think is fairly representative of what I've heard from teachers. This is from a young teacher. Um, this teacher is very experienced, um, very well educated. Um, has already had tremendous success in, in what they've been doing with, with students in high school. And this is what this teacher shared with me. I am very, very scared. I cannot sugarcoat it, and I cannot make it sound more palatable. I love teaching. I love my students. I love the subjects I teach. I love the challenge. I'm certainly not a perfect teacher, but I try very hard, and I work long hours. And, and forgive me for putting up with this email. I think, you know, we've heard some comments from teachers, but I just really want you know, these kinds of sentiments to be on, on the public record because I don't think they've been aired really in any of our discussions, at least not, not frankly. I try very hard and I work long hours. I put a lot of time and a lot of emotional investment to loving my students and preparing to make school a place of learning and care. However, thinking about this next year leaves me feeling extremely anxious. 
I recognize uh, that a lot of people feel this way, but few other jobs include such close and long-term exposure to so many people. And no other country in the world has started up school again with such high rates of COVID. As always, I feel the weight of protecting my students and even with the proposed safety measures in place, I feel that in this case, I'm incapable of protecting them. I cannot protect my students and the weight is so heavy to bear. For the first time in my life, I dread going back to school. Despite many clear measures, the safety plan suggested by the school board is still riddled with some holes. Um, uh, this person says they're grateful for the safety measures that have been included. Um, and I think we've talked about a lot of those and I think people are appreciative of the things that, that have been done. Um, but I, I won't go into some of the contingencies this uh, teacher points out, but just as an example, um, this teacher points out that in spite of everything we do in cafeterias to, you know, to maintain some protocol, students go off campus in high school and then they go and they eat and they gather and they do whatever and then they come back. And so there's, there's no way of, you know, mitigating that that's very easy. Um, this is one of the things that actually kind of concerns me, uh, you know, maybe as much as safety if not more because I've heard this pretty repeatedly. I'm deeply concerned with the extra amount of responsibility being thrust upon teachers at this time. A good example of this concerns the five minute passing period. Prior to this year, I've been asked to do these things during the past, I've been asked to do these things during the passing period. So this is what teachers have been asked to do. Um, stand near the door to welcome students into class. Um, they know at a district PD last year, uh, I was told to do this not only to get to know the students, but also to assess the mental health of students and the likelihood of any students using firearms in the school in the near future. Monitor the hallway outside the classroom for any problematic behavior and address it. Prep any materials you need before your class begins so you can get started as soon as the bell rings. And that's five minutes. And now they've been given the direction. Classroom teachers will sanitize high touch surfaces between classes. Um, and training for symptom monitoring will be developed and, and uh, delivered through our district online training platform. Uh, this teacher says, I cannot do it all. I cannot sanitize high touch surfaces and then go to a sink in a bathroom and wait in line behind the students already there to wash my hands. Um, after touching the areas that have been all been touched by students and also prepare for the next class and also greet students and so on. Um, I, I won't read any others, but I've, I've heard a lot of feedback like that and I, you know, I, I wonder at, you know, I, I know that you've taken surveys, you know, you took surveys following spring and you use that to kind of build the, the plan and, and that's really commendable. Um, you know, I, I, I know you've, you ask questions like, you know, are they at risk? Can you stay home if you need to? Um, will you be willing to wear a mask? But I would suggest that some of the, you know, those are not a complete list of questions. I mean, um, there are a lot of questions that, that you probably want to ask. Um, you know, in addition to those, like, uh, for example, how, how uh, confident are you that students are gonna maintain the guidelines that they've been instructed to maintain? How scared are you about getting sick? How well has the district communicated with you about, um, about this plan? How much has your feedback been incorporated in this plan? Um, the teachers I talk to have really innovative ideas about how we can get back to school and find you know some sort of middle ground between you know people who clearly just want to get back without any of the encumbrances of masks and so on and people who are genuinely and justifiably scared um, you know I've, I've heard some of those innovations from teachers but i worry that the district isn't fully engaging teachers in a process that will help them to you know maybe parse through some of those strategies and decide if any of them are feasible on a school by school basis as Terry pointed out last week because every school is different. And so, you know, like I said, it, it really doesn't have anything to do with how hard you're working on the plan or, you know, whether, you know, whether we're, we're trying to, to come up with all the right solutions. I just have a sense that teachers, the soldiers in this battle are worried and, and I don't think that their concerns are being directly addressed. I'm, I'm optimistic. I know we'll get through this and, and you know, this, the people in this district are brilliant. I know we'll come up with good solutions. But, you know, last week when we talked about this, there were two main premises for 
this back to school plan. One was the social distancing, which you've acknowledged that we can't maintain, even though I, I still think that's a concern, that, that you can't maintain six feet of distance in a classroom, um, especially given um, you know, doctors for a healthy environment today, their, their statement, um, that, that organization, the state of Utah, and what they said about this. But the second is, is the face covering wearing, and we've heard some comments about that tonight. Uh, you know, after I left the meeting last week, you know, I, I, I paid special attention to what was going on in the Valley, and one of the first places I went was, you know, Maverick and Hyde Park, and there were two families in there who weren't wearing masks. I, I mean, that's their prerogative in that environment, although Maverick does post, you know, something telling people that they should. But, you know, ultimately, if, if, uh, if you know, the, the, a good point has been raised, what happens when somebody doesn't show up with one, and, and how terrifying is that for a teacher who has that legitimate concern? And, and so, you know, the, the premise that, that all kids are going to come back and they're going to they're going to adhere to the, the guideline, um, I think a lot of teachers are worried about, rightfully, just in observing, you know, what's what's going on out in the community. Um, just at Green Canyon High School today, um, I, you know, I, I you know that I just came back from Island Park this morning. Um, and was there with my wife, but came back early because I wanted to be at this meeting. But at Green Canyon, there are sports uh, practices going on. There's band camp going on right now. Uh, really, nobody in the building at Green Canyon High School was wearing a mask at all, the people who were in that building. One teacher told me that they showed up to work wearing a mask uh, within the last week, and the custodian, who was not wearing a mask, just kind of yelled, there's no COVID here. And, and, and that was, uh, you know, that, that was the response he got from another staff member in the school. Um, so, you know, I, I really appreciated what you had to say last week, Dr. Norton, about, you know, you, you, you gave a very passionate, you know, heartfelt plea or commitment that if we weren't where we needed to be, you know, when school started, you would not put um, the teacher's health in jeopardy, and that was very affecting. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I followed that up with uh, an email, of course, to the board where I just said, look, let's make sure we, uh, I just repeated the things that we had heard in this meeting last week, and I just said, well, let's make sure we, did, we do that. We, we take teachers' feelings into account, but I still don't think that we're engaging them in a way that is going to give them a lot of confidence, you know, and, and um, and how this is is being rolled out, um, and so, you know, like I said, this doesn't reflect on my feelings of respect for everybody in this district and um, for you, Steve and, and Tim, and for the hard work you're putting into this. I know that this is a totally moving target, but I, I have, you know, talked to a lot of people in the last week and a half who work for the district. And, uh, and like I said, I just want to make sure that we're taking their feelings seriously, that they'll feel confident and, and they feel like they're, uh, they're actually in a partnership with the district um, instead of just having kind of, uh, you know, nuggets thrown at them kind of on the fly. Um, and, and so I'm, I have to say I have a lot of ambivalence about, you know, the different, there are all kinds of different ways of opening up you know, schools, that's not up for vote tonight, obviously. We have the proposal in front of us. I don't know which way is the best way. I mean, I'm kind of agnostic about these different approaches. We know that schools around the state or districts are kind of, you know, changing on the fly. And who knows, you know, depending on the evolution of this disease, if, if we might be forced in the same position. Um, and so I'm not making any kind of statement about, you know, opening on time versus not or, or actual protocols. I just am really deeply concerned about teachers and their level of involvement in this process. And, and I want our soldiers who are in the battle, you know, when we tell them to go into the breach, I want them to feel like they've got the tools and they've got the confidence, they've got the strategy so that they can be victorious. We have some fantastic teachers in the district. And so that, that's, that's all I wanted to say, in other words, just, to, just as a preface to the vote. So thank you very much for your time. But I mean, you'd argue that this might be the most consequential thing we're doing as a board, you know, for the last few years and maybe a few years into the future. But I just want to be very clear so that you know that I'm not 
entirely being negative about this. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, any uh, further discussion or questions? Well, I, I certainly, uh, you know, I appreciate everything you said. There's nothing that you said that isn't uh, a, a part of my DNA. I know that. Um, nothing in the plan, and I'm, I'm just going to try and, and, and try and give some understanding. There's nothing in the plan that wasn't really dictated to us by a manual that came from the State Board of Education. And we, when we received that, that plan from the State Board, it had standards that had to be met and then it had recommendations. And so we, I, we sent that to every employee in the district saying this is what's going to be guiding us as we set this plan up. So it, if they, and I know how summers are, and I'm not faulting anybody who didn't take time to read through that manual. If there's anything that I know in my life right now, other than my doctorate, there's nothing I've spent more time trying to understand than what we're trying to do with opening a school in the middle of a pandemic. And so I want you to know that from the get-go, we, we wanted information from our employees and we sent everything that we had to our employees that they could understand. We had to put a plan together that was based on the criteria that was handed to us. And so if they had read that and spent time with it, they would understand that when they did see the plan, it's just putting in words how we are going to implement what we were told we had to implement. And so it didn't lend itself up to this point. Now, from this point on, and if you would be with us on this coming Monday, when we're with our principals, you'll understand that we turn this whole process over to them, basically, and say, here's the plan. Here's everything you have to do. Now, you go to your building and see how you have to, what you have to do to implement it, which is where the, the involvement of every staff member, including that custodian who says there's no COVID here, okay? They're all going to come into the process because it doesn't matter whether there's no COVID here now. They ought to be acting like there's COVID there, okay? And I feel bad that that was, was an experience. But at, as soon as this is turned over to principals, I can guarantee you every staff member sitting out here, everyone that came last week, everyone that's worried about will have input on how's our school going to implement this plan. And they will be heavily involved. And I, and I think uh, if we didn't communicate that very well with the board or with our, with our employees, that, uh, that falls on me. But it, it takes a drastic turn on Monday. And teachers will have all the input they want. It wouldn't have matter what input the teachers had up to this point. It wouldn't have changed anything that's in the plan because the plan is just based on guidelines that we were given. And there's nothing in there that's just Tim's or mine or anybody else in the district office Oh, we feel really good about this, so we'll put it in the plan. So I just want you to understand that there's, there's coming a time, uh, my own daughter is a teacher and she's in this district and she doesn't understand this plan any better than any other teacher out there either because I haven't sit down with her either because I know that she'll be under the tutelage of a very fine principal and, and teachers have not been on contract. Uh, we, we probably could have sent out more surveys, uh, but it wouldn't have changed anything that's in the plan because the plan is nothing more than a mere image of what we told, were told, and then we had to somehow fill out an assurance plan that says, are you going to do it or how are you going to do it? So how are we going to make lunchroom work? I have no idea how Green Canyon is going to make it work. 
But I'll tell you who's sweating blood over that right now is Dave Swenson and his, his people. And they've got to make that work. And kids leaving, you know, we've never even discussed that. That's never even come up in the plan, but we can't control what people do when, they're not, when they leave our building. And they are going to go out and they are going to mix with other people and they're going to come back. Now, uh, I, if, if giving teachers more time would help, I, uh, we can, that's not a big issue. We can, we can move, when somebody wants to know, well, Jordan moved their date. And, yeah, we can move the school calendar anywhere we want. What we were trying to do was take four days that are now in the calendar that are set up to be instructional days with teachers and kids together. And by state law, you could turn those into preparation and PD days. And so instead of having kids in the classroom for 178 or 180, we could have had four days that we thought, okay, if, if there's really pressure out there to get classrooms ready, and I know there is, uh, we were going to give them four days that we weren't going to plan anything and just turn it over to them and let them have that freedom. But the law says if you're going to do that, you had to notify the public 90 days before school started. So we can't do that. But can we move the calendar and start any time we want? Absolutely. But we'll go into June. Whatever we cut off of, of August will have to be tacked on in June. And that's what these other districts have done. Unless they've gone to some model that says we're going to be doing online and we're going to count it as a day of instruction with our kids. And I can't buy into that. We are not like every other district in, in the state. We are the top district instructionally and educationally and we are going to do things that make sense when we educate our kids. So I, the question is, if, with whatever concern you have, I don't want you to, to vote against a plan because you think there's something else we could have done. If we can do it, then let's talk about it tonight and do it. Uh, and if it's just moving the calendar, we can do that. But, but I want you to know that I, uh, I take very seriously, because I'm the general sending the kids, the soldiers in. They're not going to come to you when it, something happens. I'm going to be the general they're going to come to. And, and somebody's going to say, I told you so. And I understand that. And I don't want to start school until I'm really, really, sh at least in my mind, feel like all the indicators are there that it's safe to open schools. Now, I've studied. And those people who have studied with me, we know that you can open schools if the COVID transmission rate is low in the area that you're opening the school. Okay, and I think we're there. I don't know what the fair is going to do, but I told you if the fair messes things up, I would tell you we, we shouldn't start school, but maybe we could make that decision ahead of time, and, and if it does, happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, there's no harm. But a long time ago, there was a great study done on the American high school by a great professor at UCLA, John Goodlad. And he's been my, one of my mentors since the day I read his book. And I want you to understand that when he studied the high American high school for 10 years, he came back and he said the function, not the purpose, but the function of the American high school is to provide a safe and secure environment for kids so that they can grow and develop in knowledge and skills that will go with them for the rest of their life. And the best way to do that is to have kids in an in, 
in school environment. This country doesn't operate very well without kids in school. It wasn't a really wonderful time for anybody from March through June. So I, if there's anybody who has more love for your kids than teachers, I don't know who it would be. And I know kids belong in school, but I've also got to worry about the lives of employees. And so those of you who say, I'm not going to have my kids wear masks, I don't want to have a fight with you. I've never fought over hats, I've never fought on the length of skirts, the length of hair, I've never got involved in those issues. Because I've always been able to develop a rapport with kids and parents that out of mutual respect, we come to mutual agreement that we'll understand what the rules are and we'll abide by those rules. But you can't tell me that you're going to put your kids in my class, school classes, and tell me you're not going to wear a mask. Because i got a teacher I've got to protect. And if you really love that teacher, you can wear a mask so that they don't take and end up in the hospital. Because I've got 171 people in my district who are over 65. I don't know how many more have medical issues. But I know I've got to protect them. And I can't do that if I'm having war with parents over a face mask. We've offered alternatives. If you don't feel safe with your kids in our classrooms, and it's always been your prerogative to keep them home. But I've got a whole lot of parents who want to open schools. And they have a right to do that too. And I don't want to spend a lot of time arguing with people. We aren't going to gain anything by arguing or by throwing the gauntlet down that I'm going to be this way and you can't change me. Education is all about change. That's why we educate. You hold up a study about mass and people go crazy because it came out of BYU. What if it was Notre Dame or Harvard? It doesn't matter if it's education and it's based on good sound logic. Now, I would feel terrible, and I do feel terrible, if teachers in this district think they haven't had a say in this plan. There's not been a place for them to have much of a say in the plan because we didn't have a say in the plan. We just put words down that came off of documents. That's all we've done. And, and it isn't ideal. Can I guarantee that everybody's gonna be safe who comes to our schools? No, I can't. But we'll do everything we can. And if you've lived in the state very long, you realize that we couldn't do social distancing is just not a factor for us. Utah has never invested enough in building school buildings to even lower class size. So when COVID comes along, what, what do you expect we were going to do? When we put on our plan, wherever possible, that means just exactly what it says. If we can get a kid who needs to be six feet away, we will. But can we put every kid six feet away? No, absolutely not. And you want half the kids home every other day? I, our economy doesn't function that way because we got too many really good parents who have to have two people working in order to make the family work. And if I send the kids home every other day, it messes up everything. 
So that's why we're doing five days, trying to bring everybody, give them what we know is the best education we can. And if you don't want to do it, we'll give the very best education we can online. But I can't do everything. And if I don't have your support, and if our teachers don't have your support, this whole thing will crash and we'll be back into an online situation and families will be back to wondering how they're going to make it work. So either together we work it out or I don't know what else to do. Hey, Dr. Norton, that's really well put. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your commitment to the teachers. And I don't think, you know, again, the motion's been made there's not going to be any discussion here about, you know, changing schedules or anything. I mean, certainly that's the prerogative of the district to suggest something like that beyond here if, you know, if um, circumstances with the pandemic evolve. And so, you know, you, you always have that, that right to act in that exigency. But I, I don't want to introduce a discussion about, you know, changing the calendar or anything like that. Um, because I know that you guys are, you know, are dedicated to your students. Um, you know, I've had four kids go through the Cache County School District. They've all had outstanding teachers the entire way through. I love the district administration. So I, I, I don't want this to come off as me demanding that, that no, you no demand solve whatsoever. every problem, you know, yeah. because there are too, you know, I work at the university and there are too many problems imaginable for us to, you know, it's, it's plain whack-a-mole to, to try to solve every single contingency. But I, I would, I would really like you to have those kinds of conversations with teachers, you know, the kind of conversation you're having with us here tonight um, so that they feel, you know, that, that, uh, that there's that commitment. Um, I'm not suggesting that, you know, that, that the people I've heard of from are even all that representative, although they're some of the most respected teachers in the district for sure. Um, but I, I do worry when I see things like that. Yeah, I do and too. And point out things that are. I've read. Concerns. I read that same. I read that same one. Yeah. Uh, and and I had I had feelings at the end. Uh, uh, the problem is uh, I I there's some things I can we can address. Some things you can't address. And I, I think I've laid out the issue of why we're doing five days. I think there's a there's a legitimate reason for having a shorter day, even though. It cuts down on instruction, I know that. But what are we going to do with all those kids who, for one reason or another, are in and out of the classroom this year because of COVID and, and for whatever reason? Yeah. And so that, that's why we did that. There's a rationale behind everything. We might not have communicated it very well out there, um, but it has been a tremendous little uh, uh, not been a marathon it's just been a sprint for as long as a marathon this summer and we've tried to address the concerns but I I, I really I, I'm not thinking of any demands or anything I'm just thinking if there's any issues that still need to be discussed that would help solve those issues I think they'll be solved in the next two weeks the teacher input I think that will be solved I, I, I can't imagine how it wouldn't be because principals can't do it either alone. They're just going to be handed a set of things, but now it's going to be that they've got to walk into the classroom and where we said where possible, social distance, they've got to look at every piece of furniture, decides does it stay or does it go? Do we put the desks up against the chair at uh, the two walls and then get as much space as we can going in? All those things have got to be worked out on an individual basis uh, in classrooms, which is going to have teacher input from the get-go. So I think that will be solved in the long run. That would be fantastic. It, there are just maybe three things okay. I don't know if I could suggest, and, and if you guys would be willing to, you know, codify in this plan, I, I think I'd feel, you know, a lot more positively about it in terms of, you know, teacher welfare. Um, one is, I, I just don't think we have an idea. I don't know if we really have a good representative feel for how teachers, how supportive they are of what's going on, how well they feel communicated with, um, how, you know, and I know that, you know, starting Monday, 
you know, the, the ball will be rolling quickly on some specifics, and so these problems may be solved, but I would really like to know, you know, and, and I, think, I think teachers would probably like to know what their peers feel about this so that they feel like they can express their fears, you know, without, uh, you know, constructively and, you know, without repercussions yeah. or anything. So, so whether that involves an additional survey, I don't know, but there hasn't been any gauge of staff feeling since this was released. I mean, at least not beyond anecdotally. And it would be nice to see a systematic assessment of how they feel about where it stands and what they're afraid of. You know, not, not just the, the questions about whether they'll be able to respond to the guidelines they're given, but how do you feel, how confident do you feel when the kids are coming back to class and their safety, how stressed do you feel, what are the things that make you feel the most anxious? You're right, confidence is important. We don't want to live in fear, but that's why you strategize. You know, because the more you can control your circumstances, the more confident you become, the more freedom it gives you to act. And so, uh, so that would be one way of, of addressing we, that. We do have that. Oh, good. So as soon as the plan was released, we sent, you know, actually a day before you saw it at the board meeting, we did send out information asking for any concerns, any anxiety about the plan. We do have that information. What was the response rate to that? Uh, I haven't looked recently. It wasn't nearly as high as when we sent out the requirements and uh, we, we got about 1,500 of our 2,500 employees when we sent out the state requirements and recommendations. And when we sent out do you have concerns with the plan? What are your concerns? We got back about 300 last time I looked. It may be between three and 400. And the difficulty, we can go through and interpret those. We tried to address the issues. They were much the same as I brought up earlier, some of the concerns. The difficulty is, as, you, as somebody said here tonight, Somebody's on this side, somebody's on this side, somebody's over here. Yeah, but, but we, you know, I'm a statistician, so right. I, I deal in the aggregate. Right. Know, so I want to know what percent of people are thinking about quitting, for example. Yeah. I mean, that's useful information. Yeah. Because I've heard anecdotes about it, but I. And to get that kind of information, any, you know, we would have had to ask a direct question right. like, and designed the survey that way. We didn't. We decided we, we open ended the survey so that we could get concerns maybe we didn't think about a question um, that was out there so yeah, I, I mean I hear anecdotes about you know the potential of teachers running for the door that's been oh. there's been a lot of nationwide attention paid to that issue and we right. could certainly hurt our kids in the long run if we drive a lot of experienced people out of the profession who yeah. do do that prematurely yeah and so, that that question was on the Canyon survey that we looked at um, at the district office and that was a slide we spent quite a bit of time on actually discussing was teachers reporting they were thinking about leaving the profession or taking a leave of absence or those types of things and it did show a, a quite a bit of anxiety across the state for those type of issues so, yeah, so if we could gather correct. that kind of information that would be really useful i mean if you know if we're talking about you know, if, the, if these aren't representative and we're talking about 1% of teachers or something like that, well, that's a different problem than 20 or 30. And so we just need to know, you know, have a feel for that. The second thing is something I suggested last week, and, and I think that you're moving this way because you have people on a local level working with principals, but I personally would really like to see, um, you know, something at the district level, but also obviously on a local level because all schools are different, but I'd like to see a district level, some kind of committee. You know, Utah State, you know, you can joke about this because it's a university and so you'd expect them to have task forces for everything, but honestly, there is a task force for everything. It would be the equivalent of you creating a task force for cafeterias and a task force for busing. I mean, in other words, everybody has had to establish standard operating procedures to make sure that, you know, each function of the university is able to be carried out smoothly, um, that, we, that, that we have a strategy for each unit, you know, and, and each function so that, you know, we can, we can deal with these contingencies that have been raised. You know, if the, the worst thing about COVID, aside from the tragedy of illness, is the what ifs. You know, people talk about, you know, the, the what if a student shows up and doesn't want to do this, or what if this happens, and, you know, what if students go off campus? And like I said, that's just whack-a-mole. 
I mean, it, it, it gives you a headache thinking through all the what ifs. But if you have teachers who are involved in, you know, formulating strategies for these specific, you know, uh, areas of, you know, the function, if, if they feel like they're really partnered, and, and then you, instead of taking it on yourselves to have to communicate with teachers, you let the teachers do it with each other. You know, get, get feedback. Bring it back to that commission or committee or task force, or whatever it is that you're calling it. Share that. You know, take back the response and so on. If there's that feedback loop, I think you could eliminate a lot of the, you know, the, the, the top down. And again, I know that, that a lot of this is top down because the state's dictating this to you. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, at the same time, you, you know, you still have to turn around and motivate what it is that you're doing, even if it's being, some of it's being spoon fed. Um, and so that, that's the second thing is I, I think I, I would really strongly suggest that you get direct teacher partnership in, in addressing these issues because like I said, the teachers in this district are so smart. They've got a lot of innovative solutions. You know, they've got a lot of ideas themselves. I, I know you guys know this, but some of this is already happening at a grassroots level. You know, teachers are cooperating in ways to get prepared. And if they could bring those best practices up to the fore, then it would help the district to adapt very quickly, you know, by adopting that best, those best practices without having it so diffuse. Um, I, 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 think, I think that would, you know, be my number two. I, I had a number three, but it's not worth talking about. I, I, think, I think those two things um, really for me are kickers. Um, uh, because I, I just want to know as a school board member, how big of a toll is this going to take on, on our teachers, not just in terms of their, you know, um, uh, quality of life and emotional well-being, but are any going to be running for the exits? I mean, I, I, I really think we ought to know that. And, and how are we going to deal with that contingency? So that, that's all. I, I really appreciate being able to... I'd like to just to say... I have a daughter, just like superintendent, I second what he said, and I'm concerned about her health. I taught school for 33 years in the district. I've been involved in the district for a lot more than that. Uh, I have met with teacher PLCs. I've met with the uh, classified PLCs, and the district does listen to their concerns. I know Teresa has been to several meetings. We share our concerns. Uh, I, visited with one teacher of 40 years experience and she says we need to get back to school on time and another teacher said we need to do school so and some teachers say we don't we need to look at it again but on both sides we have teachers parents that want to go and those that don't want to go and we're not going to keep everyone happy but I know with my experience in the district and the district office and administrators, they have always taken care of their teachers, their staff, the classified workers, custodians, everyone, and the students. And I think giving them that opportunity, yeah, they've got two weeks to get some work done, and those principals, that's their job, and they will do it. So I think that we're on the right track. Yeah, there's a lot to do, but let's give them their chance and they'll come forward. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, thank you for all of that. I uh, appreciate it. There's a lot to think about, and we still have some weeks to work on it. So um, since we have our motion uh, up and ready to vote on, let's go ahead and, and vote. Okay, can I propose an amendment based on those two requests that I made that they be added to the proposal somehow? Are you suggesting a, an alternate motion? Uh, no, just an amendment to the standing motion. So the, the amendment would be that um, the, there is a district commission created that includes teachers um, that uh, will help to address, you know, these, uh, these kind of functional concerns in the district. Um, so that as planning moves forward, you know, teachers feel like they have, uh, um, they have some representation in making some of these decisions about day-to-day -day logistics and so on. Um, and the second is that, you know, there, there be a comprehensive attempt to get feedback from teachers soon, 
so that we know exactly how they feel about this proposal uh, and what their biggest concerns are. I mean, that, that would be my amendment. Okay. So if it would help me to understand, we'd be voting on the plan as is, but you would like to have those two uh, amendments or two statements be the plan be contingent on we we do those two things that you brought up yeah i mean the uh the amendment would be voted on first separately and then the plan would be voted on second okay. all right yeah okay but you need a second for the amendment yes i would need a second for the amendment okay does anyone uh will anyone second the motion on the board yeah. all right so what do we do if no one seconds Is then, it, then it doesn't go up for a vote okay all so right it doesn't mean it won't be done yeah okay uh we'll go ahead then and vote on the reopening plan Thank you. The motion has passed. Uh, we want to thank everyone who is here tonight and for your input. And I'm sure from all of the comments and questions and uh, discussion, there are going to be there's going to be more work as we move forward um, on our plan. This is a good time for you to leave, unless you would like to stay and listen to the rest of the um, the meeting. Thank you again. Okay, we're going to move ahead on to um, our action agenda, and uh, we have an item to approve the 2020-2021 school calendar. Adjustment. 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 Thank you. So I presented the calendar uh, last time we met, and what we were doing is taking the PD day, February 12th, and putting it to a principal directed day before school begins. That's the change in the calendar. Okay, so could I just ask a question? If we or you decide you want to move the calendar to start a later date, can we still go ahead and approve, the, approve this and then have you work yeah, on that? Yeah, if, if there, for some reason we were gonna alter the calendar, it'd be a whole nother calendar. Okay. Yeah. All right, then I will take a, re, um, a motion to approve the 2020-2021 school <clears throat> calendar adjustment. I move that we approve the 2020-2021 school calendar adjustment. I second it. Okay. okay, any discussion on this at all? It's probably where I should have had the discussion, the question. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and vote. Thank you. All right, I will take a motion um, to uh, approve the board policy update on student fees, fee waivers, and fundraisers. I make a motion to approve the board of policy update on student fees, fee waivers, and fundraisers. Second. Any questions or discussions on this? I have a question for Mike. Um, the income chart on the second page of the fee waiver application looks similar to the application for free and reduced lunch is that what it is well these are the these are the forms that the state has right. sent you know and um, it's very similar but the state in the one form set the criteria which is very close to the free and reduced lunch for qualifying for fee waiver okay so we're just using the forms that the state and, right. and you know and they're changing them every year as they're 
getting into this new fee schedule and new program, you know, so it's, I'm just using the forms that the state right. provided. I saw that they were, I just wondered if you know if it's the same um, as the free and reduce as free and reduce I would I can get you an answer back on that I'd talk with Kirk on that and find out if, if it is exactly the same but okay. I don't know that I just wanted to know what the benchmark is for the yeah. fee waivers yeah okay. but I'll get you that answer I'll email the answer out to all the board members okay. tomorrow on that thanks all right let's go ahead and vote All right, um, last on the action agenda, I will take a motion to approve uh, the administrator's negotiation agreement. I move that we approve the administrator's negotiation agreement. Second. Um, any questions or discussion? Okay, we'll go ahead and vote. Okay, thank you. All right, um, as far as the reports agenda, um, I'm just gonna take a minute for the president's report just for a couple of things. Uh, and first of all, Terry, did the USBA send out the assignment for our board at the beginning of the month or did we just get that for the first time yesterday? <laughs> you got it at the beginning of the month. They did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got it. You did? Okay, somehow I, I missed it. But I called in today, or yesterday, to tell them that we had done that because we gave the district report. And oh, the that's state right. of the, the state you did. Of, you gave the state of the district report to each of the to legislators. To each of them. And so they have that. So does that count? Oh, sure. Okay. So we've done it. So we did our goal. <laughs> and I visited with Mr. Uh, Snyder yesterday too. Okay, good. And if anybody wants to go ahead and pass along some of the school successes, even a little bit late to our legislators, please feel free to do that as well. Would it be a good or bad idea to get our plan to them? Or don't, isn't that not a, a top priority? Mm -hmm. Our reopening plan, is that I something they would want to know or not? The legislators? To the legislators? Oh, we'll, we'll send it to our legislators, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. And then um, I did have a question. Since we're doing this meeting, do you think we'll have enough um, to talk about next week? We, uh, we plan to not have one next week unless something comes up. Okay. Yeah. All right, so then our so next we'll one. we'll just go to the next one. Uh, which would be August 13th, which is the retreat. Retreat. Okay. Does that sound good to everyone? Okay, that's all I have. So we'll go ahead and have the superintendent's report. And I, I really haven't got much to add to what to my comments. I, I do appreciate the board. I do appreciate all that you you have, uh, all the support. Um, we uh, will get through this, and. Uh, I will personally uh, try and do what uh, Chris would like to see us do. Uh, I think that's that's not that's not an unreasonable request. And uh, um, I was online with the other 50 superintendents and today, and we we're supposed to have a uh, meeting with all of us here, and and. Uh, Probably on my recommendation, I recommended that they not come. Uh, I thought bringing all the superintendents of the state together two weeks before a lot of schools are going to start wasn't a very good idea. And I, besides that, I told them the Preston Rodeo wasn't on and <laughs> there'd be nothing good to go uh, do in the afternoons. And But there was a lot of, of heartfelt expressions of superintendents today just about how difficult this summer's been 
and uh, it's it's still we've still got it and we're not at the top of the mountain and we'll get there and hopefully when we get there it's a it's a nice view and we can provide for the kids of this district what they want in this school year but it won't happen if our parents aren't supportive and uh, the mask is our main tool and uh, it's our goal that uh, we do enough groundwork with parents that they understand that it would be nice if right now they would be putting masks on their kids a little bit at the home mm -hmm. and talking about why we have masks and that masks are their way, kids' way of showing how much they love their teachers because it's probably not going to be the kids. Uh, they're going to probably get through this relatively unscathed and if they do get it, they're not going to be really sick but I still got a principal in the hospital and uh, he's only 61 and I've got 171 over 65. So parents have got to know that their children are really loved by teachers, but they got to reciprocate that love by just wearing the mask. And it is going to be that uh, we can't make a whole lot of exceptions. There will be some, but that's our way of telling teachers how much we care about them. Is we'll support them with, with the idea that it's it's a serious thing. It's not like a hat. This is really serious. So, but we'll get there. Thank you. Um, Will you be having any discussion on the possibility of moving the calendar back a few days? Not or? unless I hear that that's what you would like us to do. If you if you want us to pursue that, uh, as of right now, our, the calendar you just passed is the calendar we're working off of. And if I, the, what would change my mind is if we have a, a, a spike after the fair two weeks is about the same time we're going to be starting school if the numbers aren't good i would come to you and recommend that or if you hear from your constituents that that's something they'd like us to consider uh, that was a discussion that i wish we could have had here tonight is we don't vote on everything in this country we we started off as a republic not a democracy and you guys are their elected representatives. So if parents want a change, uh, they need to work through you. If teachers want a change, I would hope that they would work through me. And, and I've had that working relationship with the CEA. I can tell you, I have a lot of anecdotal information from principals who are talking to their teachers and that anecdotal information is not what a statistician wants to hear, but I can tell you that is an overwhelming, let's get this thing going and, and, and we'll be fine. But I also understand, and that's why I, I, I talk to all of you, we, we are going to try and, and make it possible for anybody who wants a year's leave of absence to get a year's leave of absence. And anybody that wants to retire early, we're going to open that window and give them some incentive. Every teacher or every bus driver who can be sitting at home with their family and enjoying life and not worrying about coming to school and catching COVID is a small victory for me uh, so that I don't have to worry about them. And if they, if I can work that out mutually, then I, uh, then that's a win-win, I think, for everybody. So is that message well, going out, Paul? That message will be going out Monday. Okay. Yeah. But I guess, Superintendent, from, from my standpoint, I mean, I know the devil's in the details, right? And you said Monday, that's when all the details start to come out. And, uh, you know, if the principals are like, oh, wow, what about this? You know, something comes to light that uh, we've got to deal with, then uh, 
that's where I see something coming up that we would have to delay for some reason or another. Yeah. And so I'm, be, I'm really interested to see how the, all that plays out yeah. because uh, I know that's uh, for the, you know, all these little details that yeah. we've, people haven't maybe considered and all the, the fear that's been involved with it. I'm 